Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Pilot Mountain, coming to you from Pofftown, North Carolina. It is Palm Sunday, or the sixth Sunday in Lent, or the, and it is the last Sunday in Lent. Uh, one announcement that I would like to make for uh, everyone within the, the broadcasting area is that uh, Bible study is on Zoom this week. Uh, at Wednesday at 7.30, you should receive the link in the email. Uh, if not, ask me or Bert or anyone else and we will be happy to get that to you. We are studying James and this week we are on James 3. That is the only requirement and there is no quiz about it. If you would join me now in our call to worship that is printed in your bulletin that you should have received in, the, in your email. Awake to the day of triumph for our Savior. Give thanks for this day that leads to the cross. Come with your branches, hosannas, and songs. Fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Scripture tells us that if we say we have no sin, we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So join me in our prayer of confession as we confess our sins together. Holy God, Sure of your faithfulness even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward your people in every age, we beg your mercy for our imperfect gratitude. We have looked to you for paltry favors when you have given everything. We have withheld from your people, our neighbors, and from your creation, our earth, the care and tending they deserve. We have rejected the cornerstone you sent to build a people of righteousness even here today. Forgive our failings. Heal what we have broken, nurture what we have neglected, and lead us to your vision so that we may know the peace of wholeness in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen now to the assurance of pardon. Your God has come to you, humble, in the form of a slave, to free you from the weight of sin and death. Jesus' obedient suffering has released you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the one who is exalted beyond what we can comprehend, Christ our Savior and Lord. Hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. If you would join me in our unison prayer for illumination. Let your word, O God, break open our hearts this day through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may enter into the coming Holy Week with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Listen now to the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And our second reading comes from Matthew 27, verses 11 through 54. Listen again to the word of the Lord. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, 
Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife had sent word to him, Have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. When the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took a reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself! If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's Son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We have come to the last Sunday of Lent, and this is usually a joyous time of triumph with a triumphant hymn of all glory, laud, and honor being sung while the congregation waves palm branches and sometimes the children process waving their palms or more likely smacking one another with them. It's to celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, but this year is a bit different. We are in our homes watching this and wondering just how long this will continue. We hear news reports of how bad things can possibly get and we wonder what is happening. And we know that things can change in a short time. The difference that a week can make is amazing. According to Matthew, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for the very first time on what we call Palm Sunday. Now I'm sure you know the story. He was riding a donkey, though Matthew has him riding two animals, a feat I'm sure I would have liked to have seen. And the disciples were leading him into the city. There was a considerable commotion among the people at this time. It was the time of the Passover and the city swelled from a normal popula population of around 40,000 to about 200,000 with pilgrims who had come to celebrate in the city of David. And when those who knew Jesus saw him coming, they cheered and waved branches and laid their cloaks in the road before him. And this is pretty much the basics. But there are some underlying currents that need to be addressed. Why was this such a big deal? Why were these people so excited? Was there meaning in the branches and the, and the laying of cloaks? What was Rome thinking of all of this? Well, first, this was a big deal because the people were looking for a savior. In fact, the term Hosanna, which had by the first century become a praise saying, actually means in Hebrew, save us, we pray. But they were looking for a savior, not the kind of savior that Jesus would be, coming to take the sins of the world and begin the reconciliation of all to God, but a military savior. There were many who had come and gone in the past few years. Uprisings were not uncommon, and all the rebels gone and, and all the rebels claimed to be the Messiah of God. So when the people heard that this man, the one who healed the blind and did these great deeds of power, was coming into the city, they were excited. Perhaps because it was the Passover, he had been waiting to raise the call to arms and overthrow the oppressors. Whatever it was, those who were there were excited. Now they may have caught the attention of Rome. We're not told just how big the crowd was, but it may not have been that big. Rome would likely squash a get large gathering proclaiming a king. They had increased the garrison in the city, and the governor, Pilate, had even come down from his capital in Caesarea to ensure that good order in the city was there during the festival. The crowd certainly caught the attention of the religious authorities, who seemed to not have known who Jesus was. And the crowd's action would certainly have aroused the interests of all the authorities, both Roman and religious authorities. The last time there had been a procession with branches waving and cloaks being thrown down and a man on a donkey being praised was when the Maccabees had taken Jerusalem from the Seleucid dynasty in the 160s BCE. In fact, the Maccabees even minted coins with palms on them after their victory. Also, Solomon, son of David and the last king of a united Israel, rode to his coronation on a donkey. The officials all knew their history, and they knew what would happen if Rome got wind of it. So they began to watch Jesus. During the week that followed, Jesus did some things that really got the attention of the religious officials. He went into the temple right after entering the city and ran out the money changers, what we call the cleansing of the temple, which is another thing that the Maccabees did after defeating the Seleucids. Then he began to tell parables about the end and the coming judgment. Those in power began to realize that he could be a danger to them, and so they began to plot against Jesus. As the week progressed, Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, what we know as the Last Supper, and after praying in the garden, he was arrested. He was charged with sedition and brought before Pilate, who did what he could to release him. But the authorities had stirred up the crowd 
and called for his execution. Those in the crowd calling for his execution had been cheering for him earlier in the week. Perhaps they had been bought off, but more likely they were disillusioned with the fact that Jesus did a lot of talking and little to no action. This was just another flash in the pan Messiah wannabe. And so Jesus went off to his death on the cross. It's amazing what difference a week makes. Jesus began the week coming into the city to great acclaim and ended the week being crucified, one of the most horrible ways ever conceived of to die. But the week did not go fast. In his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey says that the church in which he grew up wanted to get to Easter quickly. They saved their best decorations for that day and really passed over the week between Palm Sunday and Easter. But he points out, the Gospels do not do that at all. Rather, they slow down the action. There are seven long chapters in Matthew that cover this one week. In a book that has 28 chapters, that is almost a one quarter dedicated to one week. That week shows us who Jesus was meant to be. He was the Messiah, yes, but a different one from what the people had wanted. He was bringing new life and was ready to die to accomplish that, if that was what the Father wanted. He was telling his disciples and those who would listen that his time was short, and here was not was going to happen to those who believed and those who did not. He was also preparing his disciples for the life after he was gone. As we <laughs> excuse me, as we come into what is known as Holy Week, let us slow down. Let us not rush to get to the empty tomb, but reflect on what Jesus did and said during this week and what his death meant to the world and to us. Yet make no mistake, he will not be in the tomb forever. He will rise and we will celebrate that day on Easter. The difference a week makes. It can go from acclaim and excitement to complete despair and hopelessness to wonder, awe, and overwhelming joy. It can change everything. Amen. He would join me now in our affirmation of faith, the Nicene Creed, this being a Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. We state the universal creed that is said in churches all over the world in all languages. So let us now say what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped together and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, I ask you to look at the prayers of the people. Our prayer list is on the, toward the end of the bulletin. And I ask that you pray for our world and those who are fighting the COVID-19 virus. They are in need of prayers. They are in need of hope. They are in need of everything that we can give them. So let us now pray to God. Our Savior comes to us humbly riding a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. 
Let us pray for the church and for the world. That Christians hear and share the word of God as true disciples, God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all ends of the earth receive the words of the King of peace, God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all leaders of church and of state prefer humble service to empty power, God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all people live with gratitude for the gifts of nourishment, friendship, family, trust, patience, and hope, with the courage and wisdom to change whatever fails to be life-giving. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives draw strength from the name that is above every other name. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That we might live with gratitude for our ancestors whose faith and witness have nourished our own. That all who mourn today will be comforted. That we who hope to greet Jesus when he comes again will be ready and filled with joy. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Creator, you show your sons and daughters the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite you to come to the table. I invite you to go get your elements if you have them, while I go prepare the elements for our communion here online. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. We are told that they will come from east and west, north and south, to sup at the table with God. We look for the day that we are going to celebrate with God in heaven and with Jesus, all the saints together that are in the world and those who have gone before us. This is a table that is not just for Presbyterians, but for all who come and say that Jesus is their Redeemer. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to God our Father. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, Creator and Ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You made us in your image, setting us in your world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. From generation to generation you have guided us, sending prophets to turn us from our wayward paths into the ways of righteousness. Out of your great love for the world you sent your only Son among us to redeem us and to be the way to eternal life. You are also holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. As one of us, he knew our joys and sorrows and our struggles with temptation. He was like us in every way except sin. In him we see what you created us to be. Though blameless, he suffered willingly for our sin. Though innocent, he accepted death for the guilty. On the cross, he offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the life of the world. By his suffering and death, he freed us from sin and death. Risen from the grave, he leads us to the joy of new life. And gracious God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and juice, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body of the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ 
and with all those who are baptized in his name, that we may be in one ministry in every place, as his bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O God, in the way of Christ. Give us courage to take up our cross and in full reliance upon your grace to follow him. Help us to love you above all else and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, demonstrating that love in deed and word in the power of your spirit. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection when with the redeemed of all ages we will feast with you at table in glory. And now it is through Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty God. And with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, saying to his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you and the cup of salvation. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, our help and strength, you have satisfied our hunger with this table and the communion that we give and celebrate. We ask that you strengthen our faith, that through the death and resurrection of your Son, we may be led to salvation. For he is our Lord now and forever. Amen. As we go about Holy Week, let us slow down, let us reflect, let us remember the difference that a week can make. Until we meet again, goodbye.